Good afternoon. This is the regular meeting of the special the ordinance committee for November 22nd. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Rouse? Here. Councilmember Hotchkiss? Here. Councilmember Murillo? Here. Okay, very good. And uh, if we have any public comment that is to do not to do with the item at hand, not on the agenda, um, please come forward. Is there any public comment speakers that are not on the agenda? No. Okay, very good. Would you please read the item? Update of smoking ordinance to expand smoke-free outdoor public areas. Okay, very good. Uh, I have a number of speaker slips here. Uh, you'll be limited to two minutes at the podium. I'll let you know when your time is about to be up. Um, please be courteous to the speakers that are up there. No booing, clapping, that kind of thing. And uh, when I call your name, I will call the person right behind you. So if you could uh, be in ready and be in line, then we can get through this quickly and get to the item. Uh, the first speaker will be Bob Stout. Mr. Chair, we're not going to have a staff presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Council I'm Member. Sorry. I knew I was missing something. Very well done. Nina, are you doing the staff presentation? Yes, Mr. Chair. Didn't mean to forget you. We're eager to hear them. Yeah, I, I am actually am, but uh, thank you for pointing that out. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Ordinance Committee members. My name is Nina Johnson, and I'm the Senior Assistant to the City Administrator. Uh, today, I'm here to present some options for the Ordinance Committee to review in terms of expanding our current smoking laws and looking at outdoor public areas. So if we look at Santa Barbara's current smoking ordinance, it was last updated in 2002. And uh, since that time, a lot has changed, and our ordinance is no longer consistent with state law. The American Lung Association also each year does an annual review of cities and assigns a grade, essentially, for their local policies on uh, tobacco control and smoking uh, laws. In that review, Santa Barbara received a grade of a D, um, and then nearby cities in our region and other visitor-serving cities uh, really have adopted tough, tougher smoking laws um, r with grades ranging, you know, all the way up to an A, Santa Monica, Pasadena receiving an A, Ventura uh, receiving a C uh, nearby Ventura. So uh, we're looking at updating our smoking ordinance uh, following direction that we received uh, in October. Uh, last month, council directed us to look at various public uh, smoke-free areas, conduct public outreach, and have the ordinance committee make, re make recommendations on outdoor public areas to consider banning smoking. The tobacco retail licensing ordinance was also part of the council direction, and that will be brought back to the ordinance committee at a future date. As part of the public outreach, I do want to mention also that we received, uh, we created a special email address that was promoted in various communication channels. Uh, and through that, we received 120 letters and emails from the public in relation to smoking. And all of those emails were uh, received directly by the, the committee and by the full council. By way of background, um, the city has the authority to ban smoking beyond state law via the California Indoor Clean Air Act, uh, which authorizes strong local control uh, of, smart, of smoking. Under state law, effective in June of this year, smoking was essentially redefined to include vaping devices and also or the use of vaping devices and also marijuana smoking. With the Adult Use of Marijuana Act passing in uh, November a few weeks ago, uh, also known as Prop 64, uh, that uh, included a section on the use of marijuana. So it specified that smoking marijuana is not permitted while driving a vehicle, in any public place other than a business licensed for on-site consumption, and locations where smoking tobacco is prohibited. There are a number of factors to consider uh, that the Ordinance Committee should consider in looking at designating outdoor public areas as smoke-free. Uh, limiting exposure to secondhand smoke, reducing litter and cleanup costs uh, with fewer cigarette butts in public areas, lowering the risk of fires in parks and outdoor areas that due to our drought condition are, are very dry, any type of smoking ban in additional areas uh, than what we currently allow is going to limit the number of allowable smoking areas 
uh, for residents and out-of-town visitors that smoke. So that's uh, an important consideration uh, for the Ordinance Committee to make. From this point, I'm going to review all of the different possible outdoor public areas that smoking could, we could designate as a smoke-free area. Stearns Wharf and the Harbor. Stearns Wharf is currently an area by administrative policy. Smoking is not allowed up uh, uh, except for designated areas. But we have regular smoking incidents there, small, small scale fires that start in those designated areas. And our last major fire on the wharf was due to a discarded cigarette. So that's a, a serious safety issue for a very flammable facility. Our parks and sports fields, uh, we could consider banning smoking. Um, many of these areas are also dry due to the drought. Sports field, an example would be our ball field, Pershing Park ball field would be an example of that. Beaches, our uh, public beaches, uh, there are a number of uh, cigarette butts that wind up there. Uh, people can smoke on the beach currently. During the last few years of coastal cleanup day, thousands of cigarette butts were collected each year of the cleanup on all of our local beaches. So there is definitely a, a serious amount of cigarette butt litter uh, on the beaches. Trails, we could specify by ordinance uh, to be smoke-free areas. Currently, they're not uh, smoking is prohibited in the wildland urban areas, in the high fire hazard area, but we could go a step further and restrict smoking completely on all trails. Recreation facilities, and specifically we're talking about outdoor, uh, outdoor areas of recreation facilities. So Spencer Adams, the lawn bowling area would be an example. Outdoor library facility areas uh, we could specify in our smoking ordinance. Currently this is a sign from our library grounds at the central library. Smoking is not allowed, and that's through the authority of the library director. But we don't have our library, outdoor libraries specified in our smoking laws. Public parking lots and parking structures, again, emphasizing to everyone that it, these are publicly owned, city owned parking structures. Um, this would help with cleanup uh, of cigarette butts, uh, reducing the litter. Outdoor restaurant seating areas. Currently, we allow, uh, unless by restaurant policy it could be different, but by our current ordinance, before 10 p.m., 25% of outdoor seating areas can be designated for smoking. And then all of those tables are allowed for smoking after 10 p.m. Unless by the restaurant policy, uh, they have a, a different policy. Some may not allow smoking at any time. So it's possible for us to designate outdoor seating areas for restaurants as non-smoking. Outdoor bar seating, seating areas. We currently allow, by ordinance, smoking to occur at all times of the day. Um, so there is no restriction in those areas, front or back patios. We had a meeting with uh, bar owners earlier this month on November 3rd, and uh, the bar owners were uh, expressed their interest in keeping that restriction. They would like to remain exempt from any future smoking restrictions and allow smoking on those patios. Entryways within a certain distance of doors, windows, or any openings into enclosed areas. That's another area that uh, could, smoking could be restricted. So that could be 20 feet or a certain designated uh, number of feet away from an entryway. Outdoor work sites, such as construction sites, uh, could be regulated for, could be designated as smoke free. Sidewalks uh, we could look at. Um, either in a certain area, uh, commercial areas, all sidewalks we could look at, public paseos. Uh, we have a number of private paseo areas that already have private policies in place. Public events, festivals, farmers markets, parades, concerts, any event open to the public we could consider designating as smoke-free. Uh, just by example, we have a number of areas that have a private policy in place for their campus or their event. The farmer's market, for example, does not allow smoking. And if you walk through, you will see signage uh, that indicates no one is allowed to smoke. 
but in hearing from them, even in that location, uh, because we allow smoking on the sidewalks, uh, for example, on State Street, they are affected by smokers on the sidewalks, even though they have a policy to not allow it uh, on the street at the market. Some other areas that have a private policy uh, for their campus or their uh, area open to the public, City College, the Schott Center are considered smoke-free. Earl Warren Showgrounds is considered smoke-free. UCSB, even though it's, uh, these are, some of these locations are not within the city, but uh, UCSB is a smoke-free campus, the full campus. Paseo Nuevo, El Paseo, they've got a sign here of right next door. This is the photo of El Paseo. Uh, those are considered smoke-free. The farmer's market that I previously mentioned. And the housing authority also has a policy for their units uh, to not allow smoking, with the exception of El Carrillo, with a special needs population that is recovering uh, from abuses, su substance abuse. Um, looking at approaches in other cities... Uh, most cities have, have looked at, have already designated their parks, beaches, recreational facilities, piers, wharfs as smoke-free. So those areas are included in most cities' uh, smoking ordinances. Uh, if we were to look at an approach... Uh, I mean, when you say most cities, are you talking nationwide? Uh, I'm looking... Uh, for this type of review, I mostly focused on California cities. Okay. In Southern and California cities, cities. Or, or, or California cities entirely? Uh, comparable cities in California. And I would look at the attachment, attachment two or attachment one to the staff report for some of the, those cities that we looked into. That's pretty much coastal cities, as I recall. Correct. Thank you. If we were to look at one of the broader approaches that's in use uh, in San Luis Obispo, uh, Carpinteria nearby, they, instead of designating every single location, as I just mentioned, as I just reviewed in the presentation, they prohibit smoking in any public or private place open to the general public. So any, any public place, op any public or private place open to the general public. And what they do there is they allow smoking where smokers, non-smokers are not present or not expected to arrive due to the location or the time of day. So while they prohibit smoking generally in all public places, uh, this basically means that smoking would be permitted at, let's say, a sidewalk at 3 a.m. if no one else is around and not expected to walk by. So that is the approach in place at San Luis Obispo and Carpinteria. And the, again, just re we're just reviewing different options uh, that other cities have, take, have used. Carpinteria also, and there's, there are a few other cities that have tried something similar, they allow smokers outposts, so designated smoking areas that the businesses could create. They don't have any in place right now in Carpinteria, but they have an option for that built into the ordinance. Sidewalks and entryways, there are different approaches there. Uh, a few, Santa Monica, they prohibited smoking on the 3rd Street Promenade, so they designated, they found a specific area that would be smoke-free. And they look at, uh, basically, the smoke, non, smoking is not permitted within 20 feet of a building entryway. So this, this basically means that in other areas of the city, uh, if, you're not, if you're prohibiting smoking within 20 feet of building entryways, that's essentially the sidewalk. Uh, Pasadena is the same, Smoking is not permitted within 20 feet of an entryway unless uh, someone is actively passing by on the way to another des destination. So this would mean an individual or a group that is congregating, staying in one place, smoking. Um, that would not be allowed, but someone passing by with a cigarette uh, would be fine and not bothering any adjacent individuals because they're in motion. Here's a quick map of a State Street sidewalk. Uh, most of our sidewalks, in talking with our engineering uh, division, most of our sidewalks uh, throughout the city are about five to eight feet. But just in case there's a con if uh, the ordinance committee wants to consider a distance from entryways, 20 feet on State Street is going to get you almost to the edge of the street. Our, our sidewalks there are 25 feet. So 20 feet gets you pretty close to to the edge. So just in case you want to know what 20 feet gets us uh, here on State Street or if you're interested in placing a certain number of feet, that's, uh, that gives you some context. 
our next steps from this point are to hold a public hearing and get input and to get direction from the ordinance committee on any issues to follow up and to receive any recommendations on areas that you consider smoke free. I did want to point out that um, staff, after reviewing all of the areas, and this is pointed out in the staff report, there are a number of areas that staff would support banning smoking. Uh, our, a lot of our managed facilities, Stearns Wharf, the harbor, beaches, parks, sports fields, trails, community centers, our outdoor recreation facilities, outdoor library areas, and public parking structures and lots. And then the remaining areas where staff is more neutral uh, in those areas. And these are all uh, called out in the staff report. Would you elaborate where those neutral areas are in staff report? Oh, sure. So the areas where uh, staff would be more neutral and waiting for um, an open to direction from the ordinance committee, outdoor patio areas for restaurants, any changes in the restrictions there, outdoor patio areas for bars, entryways to public buildings, sidewalks, and commercial, I'm marking it commercial areas, but it could be any sidewalk, paseos, public events, parades, and outdoor work sites. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Any other questions from the committee? Ms. Murillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of questions? Yes. I see Mr. Garza in the back. Mr. Garza, may I ask you a question about um, our parking structures um, and why your staff is recommending to restrict smoking there? Do a lot of people smoke in the parking structures? And we have open park, we have parking lots, and then we have parking structures. What's your, your um, the information you can give us about smoking in the parking structures, please. Um, smoking in the, in the lots and structures create a maintenance problem for us, and it, uh, <clears throat> it's a big cleanup hassle. Oh, and secondhand smoke, I mean, do people smoke at night when they come from the bars or people taking a break from their work and they go out and smoke in the lot? What, what's your experience? In the structures, in the... In the elevators and in the stairwells, many times you can, uh, the, the smoke lingers for hours. Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're recommending, uh, you're saying that when they clean up, there's a lot of cigarette butts as well? Yes, there are. Okay, well, you're awfully concise with your, your words today, Mr. Garza. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Hodgkins. Mr. Garza, we don't have a fire hazard there, or we do. Um, the only fire hazard I would see in the lots where we have uh, landscaped areas which are mulched. I'm, I'm sure the uh, – I haven't had a fire break out yet, but uh, right, cause we have had them in the trash cans. Sometimes people throw uh, cigarette, uh, um, smoldering cigarette butts in the trash cans that we had yeah, to put out. The my, my impression was at least fire-wise we're pretty safe there because they're concrete structures. Well, they, they are, but um, things do burn in the structures. Um, tr the trash cans are in the structures as well. And uh, um, we would be concerned about that. So are you strongly against smoking there or just think it might be a good idea not to have it? Both. We support the we support interesting the, answer. We yes. support the, uh, uh, the, the proposed no smoking ban in the structures and lots, and we think it's a good idea. It's, it's, it it, it uh, saves us a lot of uh, maintenance. Maintenance, hassle. cleanup is tough. Correct. But we, we haven't had any fires from cigarettes there, or we have? Yes, we have, in the trash cans. Trash cans, yes. got it. Okay, thank you. Yes, you could run for city council. I'm joking. <laughs> um, serious subject, I'm sorry. So if we decide to recommend today this to go on to city council, when would it come back? That might be a question for Mr. Kalan. I had a couple of messages today that a lot of people hadn't heard about this, but the chamber is full today, so some most people heard of it. If we, if today we reckon, if we sent it to city council, full city council, when would it come back? Probably. Um, Mr. Chair, Councilman Mario, we'd want to come back with the actual language to you to review before we went to city council. Okay. So there's plenty of time to hash out whatever we might hash out. And then, so in the new year is really yeah, absolutely. when the council, and, and, so everybody could spread the word 
Well, I've, I've got the mic. Just one quick update. In, in June of this year, state law was amended to forbid smoking near tot lots and playgrounds and public parks, 25 feet. So uh, we're not preempted there, but that is in effect under state law now. Starting January 1st? No, uh, Start beginning last June 9th, actually, of 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just had a couple of quick questions for staff. Uh, we talked about public sidewalks and paseos and whatnot, um, but then we also talked about outdoor bars or outdoor patios. If if a uh, if an operator had leased part of the public part of, uh, part of the public right of way as we do to certain bars and restaurants, are those now public sidewalks or are they leased premises that are under control of the operator? How will we do that definition wise? Councilmember Rouse, um, by my understanding, um, the least area of the city sidewalk is still considered the sidewalk. So even though the, the, the operator may have control over and licensing of, then that would be a private area. Mr. Colon, would you care to chime in on that for me? Oh, not really, because I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well. Got the, 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 very honest answer. Thank you. And then uh, the El Carrillo and the housing authority is carved out because of the recovery issues at that particular facility. Yet there are other there are other facilities in Santa Barbara which deal with people in the recovery sector of society. Um, are we going to be looking at trying to figure that out as well? I mean, it seems a little inequitable to to say the El Carrillo and then leave out other institutions that deal with people that are in recovery. And uh, I know that I spoke with people at the rescue mission and they were actually fine with the restriction, but I am concerned that other people from that uh, who, who were in treatment will get to weigh in because if, and I don't know how essential that is. Do we, but is there an authority that we're going to be speaking with on that in terms of the, the, the the, the medical, mental, physical needs of, of, of providing for that? Based on the previous council direction, it didn't seem that there was interest in looking at those areas, but uh, if the ordinance committee would like us to look into more of those areas, we could. Uh, the rescue mission, they do not allow, they do not allow smoking on their in their facilities except for a few designated areas. So they have a private policy in place okay. and we could explore more of those facilities if the ordinance committee is interested. All right. Yeah, I think, I think that may be helpful as we go forward. Okay. Sorry for being out of order before. Uh, I'm supposed to, so anxious to hear from you guys that I just jumped the gun. So we will start again with public comment. Once again, two minutes per speaker and I will start with Bob Stout to be followed by uh, Peter uh, Dagenhart. You have two minutes. Hi, council members. I got to say, this is more entertaining than the general uh, council meetings at large. <laughs> um, I, how to cover this in two minutes? I own the Wildcat Lounge. I also I've been in business for downtown since 1984 on State Street, uh, Zello back in the day. And, and <clears throat> Councilman Rouse, I think you yourself were involved in 1997 when the issue of uh, stopping smoking indoors in bars, restaurants came to be, and we all thought, oh, my gosh, how's this going to affect our business? Um, that question was asked to me last night when I met with um, Don Goldberg and Don Dunn. We had a really uh, good conversation about the whole subject. Um, Mr. Goldberg said, uh, don't you think it would be the same thing after six months or a year? Business really wouldn't be affected that much. And I just responded at that point, many of us in the business uh, spent the money, went through the government, you know, uh, procedures to get licensed patios. So that gave our customers an option to go outside and smoke, and we didn't lose those people. Quite simply, if people leave your business, if smoking were banned on patios of restaurants or bars, restaurants after 10 o'clock, whatever, um, yes, we would lose business probably 15 to 30 percent. Um, that's the general consensus. Um, I hate to mention business and health in the same two minutes. It's difficult. I understand secondhand smoke is bad. I, know, I understand the health ramifications of it. But I have to stick up for the many customers, residents, tourists of Santa Barbara who aren't here, who enjoy being able to 
go outside and have a cigarette. I found over the last five years, and I think it's pretty, you'll find a consensus, uh, people who smoke on patios are much more, they're getting it. My smoking is dropping. It's, re- it's reducing. It's uh, decreasing, sorry. Um, people are very, very uh, cognizant of the fact that they want to be uh, respectful, move away, et cetera. Finally, on marijuana, we were, I think there was a concern that if patios, particularly on State Street, if Prop 64 passed, which it did, that marijuana would be smoked and then uh, people would just be you know, smelling marijuana on the way. That's not going to happen because Prop 64 said that marijuana can't be smoked in public places. So we talked to the Alcoholic Beverage Control, and there can't be that. So I know my time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Pete Dagenhard, and then followed by Don uh, Zagning. Don, I'll go over that. You know who you are. Hello, council members. My name is Pete Dagenhardt. I've owned Elsie's Tavern for the last 16 years, and um, I wrote something down that I'd like to read about this upcoming ordinance. Uh, We are an international travel destination, and much of the city and the city's workforce's income comes directly or indirectly from tourist money. Smoking is a very prevalent thing in foreign countries. These tourists already cannot smoke in hotel rooms, If they cannot walk around the block or go to a local bar to smoke due to a non-smoking ordinance, then there will be some very unhappy tourists. Um, Which will lead to reduced tourism, a subsequent loss of bed tax income, and lower job availability, possibly job loss to many employees. Tourists being stopped by police for smoking is not going to foster joyful vacation memories this city has and should continue to foster a positive tourist experience. Um, to provide this segment of tourists a place to enjoy themselves, it should be considered to allow smoking on the streets later in the evening after families and kids go home, as well as bars should continue to be allowed to let people smoke on their patios. Um, another aspect is that a complete ban will force smokers in their cars to smoke, which would just shift the smoke from one place to another, as can be seen in Carpinteria, where a complete ban of smoking in public areas is in place and smoke is often wafting out of parked cars. Um, a noteworthy example is San Luis Obispo, where the Lung Association awarded a B grade, just like in Carpinteria, but smoking on bar patios is still allowed and sidewalk smoking is not fined when no other person is bothered by it. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Ms. Mario has a question for you. So, Mr. Degenhart, um, you're, we had a meeting um, with Mr. Stout, and you agreed to meet with some of your neighbors sure. that are near Elsie's. Sure. And so I just wanted to acknowledge you for that, that. Oh, yeah. I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to be done, fans or smoke eliminators or charcoal filters. Um, I've never been personally approached by them. So this is somewhat new to me. I have an open door every day. Um, People can come in. I'm very approachable, and I'm willing to do whatever is possible to negate that. I I found out that they are willing to meet with you, too. Okay. And so uh, Kelly Bartlett is talking to some of her neighbors to, you know, to to put together a meeting. Okay. And um, it is unusual where you are that you're so close to a residential property. Right. Well, we were there for... 20 plus years, and those condos went up seven years ago. So um, that kind of, kind of came to us rather than be to them. <laughs> Very good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Don Zacanino, uh, followed by Katie Torres. You got my name right, sir. I did. <laughs> wow. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, my name is Don Zacanino, <clears throat> and I've been a small business owner on the 500 block of State Street. For 22 years. In that time, we have worked with all the various agencies to keep and promote downtown as a safe and flourishing part of our city. Tourism is a $1.4 billion industry in Santa Barbara, and a good amount of those people come from Europe, where the smoking population averages from 25 to 31 percent. It would be a shame to lose those people and their families. Eight years ago, I had to change, as, I had to change the, zo- the zoning and rebuild my back patio to comply with new codes just to allow smoking on my back patio. This was at the cost of $80,000 to me that I could neither afford nor have made back as a result. I am asking that if you implement the no smoking law that you please start slow and test it in places the city is responsible for, such as the parks and beaches, and see how that works first. When the liquor ordinance was passed, 
some 10 odd years ago, what most people agreed on was finding a way to stop the homeless from drinking openly in, those, in the public places, those same places. The result was that your average citizen lost his right to enjoy himself responsibly, excuse me, and we're still stuck with the problem that the law was passed to rectify, and that's the homeless drinking in the parks or on the beaches. So again, I ask you, please start with the places you're responsible for and leave private business to make its own choice and let our customers decide for themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Katie Torres will be followed by Ty and Davidson. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My name is Katie Torres, and I'm the Policy and Communications Specialist at First Five Santa Barbara County. First Five Santa Barbara County was established in 1999 after California voters pro uh, pro excuse me, passed Proposition 10, which imposed a 50 cent sales tax on tobacco products, and those revenues were used to support children and families. While my job and the work that we do at First Five is funded by tobacco toddlers, I'm here this afternoon on behalf of our commission, advisory board, and staff in support of updating the City of Santa Barbara's smoking laws to expand smoke-free to outdoor public areas. First Five Santa Barbara County believes that eliminating tobacco use in uh, parks, beaches, restaurants, and communities where young families frequent will provide our children and families a healthy environment in which they play and learn where they are not exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, it also protects our children from exposure to discarded cigarette butts and potential burns. It also demonstrates a healthy tobacco-free community norm, especially for our children allowing tobacco use in parks, on our beaches, and in other recreational areas where families of young children sends a dangerous mixed message about healthy living. Tobacco use is not a behavior that we want to model for our children in our communities. Research shows that tobacco-free policies can reduce and even prevent tobacco use among children. We at First Five appreciate all of you for reviewing the City of Santa Barbara smoking laws to expand smoke-free in outdoor places. Thank you. Thank you. Ty Davison will be followed by Aurelio Bocanegra. Good afternoon, Council. I am here to speak on behalf of um, consumers and just the general, the general public. Um, I support many of the bars here in town. I personally do not smoke. I don't like it for myself, but many of my friends do smoke. A lot of us, we're working people. We work nine to five. We only see each other at some of these bars. Sometimes, you know, just for the sake of having good conversation, if they have to go outside to have a smoke, I follow because I want to engage with them. But I know that I have that choice of staying away from an area where smoking is allowed. So if it bothers me, then if I choose to take myself out there, then I'm responsible for whatever side effects may or may not happen. And also, a lot of the concerns that I've seen addressed in the PowerPoint here, some of the things that I'm hearing now, aren't necessarily issues for the bar owners because these places aren't necessarily open to the general public. So someone wandering by, you know, the only way they might be affected, they would have to stand in line, pay a cover, and then go out to a smoking area. Um, there aren't necessarily, you know, places where children are allowed. I don't think any of these bars allow children to come in, so I don't think that that would be a real concern. And so for me as a customer, I would just like to think that, you know, personal responsibility is always on me, and I don't believe in legislating morality. You know, if, there, if the general public, you know, if it's a concern for the general public, then yes, by all means, let's look at it. But if it's my own personal um, morality issue or whatever, smoking, or I think someone's going to smoke marijuana, I don't like those things to be just kind of like left up for other people to decide for everyone. So again, you know, just to support the businesses here um, and to support my friends who can't speak because they're at work today, I don't necessarily want them to have to lose their personal freedoms to be able to go outside into a designated area and smoke at a place where they're supporting that business. That's all. Thank you. Aurelio Bocanegra, followed by Jessica Simon. Good afternoon, council members. Um, I thought the whole council was going to be here today, so I... I'm going to read it the way I had uh, prepared it. Um, during the last 10 years, I have stood in front of this council and previous councils and spoke on this issue. Also, along with others, have met with previous council members to discuss this issue. When Mayor Snyder was a councilwoman, she gave us the definition of what is known as environmental justice. Most of us have experienced a moment of powerlessness because of an injustice. One or more of you may believe that smokers have rights. That would qualify as being in denial. The acronym for denial is don't even know I am lying. 
and businesses may claim that they will lose business. They suffer from a lack of information. 20 years ago in Los Angeles, this was the same debate. And in the end, businesses did not lose. They actually increased their profits. <clears throat> a child's right to breathe is not negotiable. The voters in the state of California approved a ballot measure recently to increase the cost of a pack of cigarettes by, I believe, $2. Today again, this council has an opportunity to choose to do something that is far reaching and long overdue, or decide ultimately to keep Santa Barbara stuck in its own evolution. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica Simon will be followed by Philip Wright. <clears throat> My name is Jessica Simon, and um, I have Down syndrome. I'm also a trike county's client and um I also have asthma and so I think that there should not be smoking around town for my friends who have developmental disabilities and um it, it, for me it's a health issue because I don't want to I have, have lost um I had weight loss surgery I have lost over 212, I was over 212 pounds. As of today, I'm at 125, which is a big step for me. But what I would like is I agree with the smoking ordinance and to be able to, to be smoke free. So that way I won't have any more asthma attacks because asthma is a concern to me and I'm Really appreciate that, so I can breathe better. Thank you. Thank you, Phil Bright. Be followed by Sheila Demore. Demone. Good afternoon. I'm a small business owner here in Santa Barbara in the 400 block, and also in a bar up on. Um, up near Upper State, I just wanted to put my concerns as, uh, with you guys as far as us. Like Don said, we all spend uh, quite a bit of money to have a patio outside, you know. So there is an area s separate for 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 smokers, and so the non-smokers have their spot. We, um, I think, if you start subjecting into our property, I think you're really moving into a kind of an open can of worms. Where does it stop? Type thing. I pay a lot of rent. I paid a lot of money to do what I do down there, and you know we keep it clean. If you start saying, you know, smoking, you can't do it in a bar. Next thing, it's going to be people are going to be outside, just like Don mentioned. There's people still with open containers in front of my bar. We don't do anything about that. But if the smoke is, at least if it's contained in our business, we do clean up at night. There's not a single cigarette out in front of my bar. That's for my customer. It goes into an ashtray. So you are containing it, and as far as children, again, we don't allow children into our establishments. So you're actually containing it, and if you say we're going to have smoke-free zones, then perhaps maybe the bars are the best place to do it at. You know, it's, the city still can claim their tax dollars, which obviously everyone still wants the money from the cigarettes, or because if everyone quits smoking, then there's no tax dollars. So um, that's just my peace of mind, and you know, I like to say I like to keep everyone's civil liberties open to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shell Demon, uh, followed by Nicole Unru Enos. Good afternoon. My name is Shella Dumong. Um, I'm a downtown resident. I'm here in support of the ordinance committee um, updating the smoking ordinance um, and expanding. Uh, <clears throat> smoke-free areas uh, in Santa Barbara, and most particularly to bar patios. Um, one of the business owners earlier talked about how there should be uh, smoking allowed after um, families and kids go home, but for those of us that reside next to bar smoking patios, um, we are at home. Our kids are at home. Our families are with us. We're exposed to the um, secondhand smoke of dozens and dozens of individuals seven days a week. For us, it's about 11 hours a day, and there is no safe level of exposure. 
I'm counting on the ordinance committee to protect us, to protect people who are at impact of secondhand smoke from businesses. Um, you have a tough decision to make because basically you've got an entire business community here present invested in the entertainment um, and drinking and uh, food industry relying on their smoking patrons. And you need to protect people who reside next to these businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nicole Unru Ennis, uh, followed by M uh, Michael Stamont. Hi, Council. How are you? Well, thank you again for hearing everyone's opinion. I know this is a big issue coming before you. Um, of course, I manage a nightclub downtown, um, but I'm going to speak not on behalf of the business today. I did that a couple months ago, and I feel like those issues have been heard by you, and um, I'm sure uh, there's a lot more to, to go into it from everyone else. But I wanted to speak as just a non-smoker, but I have a friend, a lot of friends that do. And for me, this is a safety issue in terms of where will my friends be able to enjoy a cigarette while having a cocktail. Um, for an example, uh, since coming for a cancel a couple months ago, I've been really uh, attentive to situations with my friends, with my girlfriends that are having a cigarette um, or having a drink at the bar and they want to go enjoy a legal substance, tobacco, in a designated area on the patio. And like um, another person that came up here said, I, wanna, I have the choice to go with them or not. And I and so that's my choice. Um, now, if they didn't have a designated area on a patio, where would they go? Where would my friend who is in a safe environment consuming a legal substance, having a drink, and they have to go outside to where? A dark alley um, where a lot of other activity can happen. Um, so in my thoughts today, I just want to look at the fact of safety. Men women who will be going, trying to find a place to smoke, and the other issues that could come with that, and regulation, and also their right to be in an area that is a legal um, area to consume alcohol and to consume tobacco. And so thank you. Obviously, the health concerns and all of that is very valid, and I support all of, all of those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Stamat, followed by Penny Owens. Okay, Penny Owens then. So you're, you're ceding your time, Ms. Owens? Okay. You have four minutes. Oh, I don't think he's ceding his time to me, though. You're not ceding your time, Ms. Owens? Else, right? I'm ceding my time to someone else. Okay. To someone else, I'm sorry. And who would that other person? <laughs> Has that other person come up yet? Okay. No, I pass. He passes. Okay. I don't think I need four minutes. Okay, but. you're not going to give <laughs> Done. Okay, very good. Penny, two minutes, please. All right, good afternoon, uh, Chair and Council Members. Penny Owens with Santa Barbara Channel Keeper. As you know, Channel Keeper works to um, protect and restore the Santa Barbara Channel and its watersheds. And as we all know, trash is making its way to our oceans at an alarming rate. And one of the ways that Channel Keeper is working to address this problem locally is by hosting frequent beach and creek cleanups. Through our beach and creek cleanup efforts, cigarette filters are repeatedly the number one item that we're picking up. Our findings are consistent with other local cleanup statistics as well as what's seen across the country and also the globe. And um, one of the staff referenced uh, Coastal Cleanup Day. Just this year's Coastal Cleanup Day, it's not even 100% of the data, picked up more than 12,000 cigarette filters. In a one-day event in three hours, 12,000 cigarette butts. In Channel Keeper's um, cleanup efforts over the past few years, we um, adopted West Beach, just that tiny little beach between Stearns Wharf and the harbor, and we've picked up more than 14,000 cigarette butts there. And an example, we did a, an, an East Beach and West Beach cleanup event where volunteers were out doing a cleanup for about two hours, and volunteers picked up 1,500 cigarette butts. And truthfully, um, we don't believe these numbers are, are accurate. I believe they're underrepresenting the actual number of cigarette butts out on our beaches because our volunteers are often overwhelmed by the sheer volume of cigarette butts that they're finding on the beaches. The city's creek division um, works with contractors to pick up litter at and around Santa Barbara's creeks. 
And in the past two months, when the contractors have began counting the actual number of cigarette butts they're picking up, they've removed 9,700 cigarette butts from Santa Barbara's creeks and beaches. And that's just two months' worth of data. So um, these cigarette butts are not just pieces of non-biodegradable plastic, but they also contain many harmful products. And there's some emerging science and studies even conducted by San Diego State University that are identif identifying just how toxic these used um, cigarette filters are to the um, organisms in the aquatic environment. And an example of that study found that the, um, what was it? One filter cigarette butt had the ability to kill fish living in a one liter bucket of water. You don't need to wrap up, please. All right. So we um, encourage you to support an enhanced smoking ordinance, um, not only for the safety and health of our community, but also to protect our wildlife, our creeks and beaches, and the environment. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Julia Wynn to be followed by Paul Bullock. Good afternoon. I came completely unprepared because I found about, out about this at the very last minute, although I've been preparing for this pretty much my entire life. As a child, my, mother, my parents smoked, and I got asthma on account of it. Uh, my father died from COPD, from smoking two, three packs of cigarettes a day. And I feel very strongly, and I've become allergic to cigarette smoke, so if I, I don't have the choice to go out in a bar where there's cigarettes, I mean, I don't go to a bar anyway, but say, I don't have a choice to expose myself to cigarette smoke. It's highly toxic, and it, it hurts everyone, the smokers and non-smokers alike. Um, I basically stopped shopping on State Street because of the amount of sec secondhand smoke that is there all the time. And it's uh, true that on these patios and bars, the, even if they're designated, and I'm sorry, it costs a lot of money for the bar owners to put them up, but cigarette smoke does not stay in the air over the bar patios. There are condos nearby, and they do waft up, and it does affect the people who do not smoke, their health of themselves, their children, their pets. So I just wanted to uh, say that I very much support any and all non-smoking ordinances, that if people choose to smoke, that is their choice. They're welcome to do it. But it is not fair to harm other people with secondhand smoke. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul Bullock, be followed by Brooks Jeff. Jet. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Paul Bullock. I am the general manager of the Eagle Inn, a small hotel downtown Santa Barbara. And I'm the president of Hospitality Santa Barbara. I'm here today to represent Hospita Hospitality Santa Barbara. We're an organization that speaks for a large number of tourist-based businesses, such as hotels, restaurants, wineries, and tour companies. We received a presentation at a recent board meeting from a couple of um, people who were uh, uh, consultants to the city about um, this ordinance. As a board, we discussed the ramifications of this type of ordinance. We polled many of our members, and we would like to add our opinion to the discussion. The Board of Hospitality Santa Barbara welcomes a suggestion of banning smoking in public areas to include sidewalks, the harbor, the waterfront, etc. However, we would prefer that businesses are allowed to set their own policies within a framework that the state has already set. There are currently laws in place that regulate smoking. The time it's allowed, the percentage of floor space, the wafting of smoke into proximal areas. We would ask that rather than adding additional regulations that may hinder the profitability of these businesses, that we just enforce the current ordinances. Allow the operators of business to do what they do best, make money and pay taxes. We don't want to lose business over this and feel that additional regulations only serve to stifle our opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Brooks Jett, followed by Adriana Almazan. Hello. Um, hi. I work for CADA, the Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, and in particular with youth. And um, this just this last week, we did a little project to just to test our knowledge to see how much they knew about tobaccos and the issues with tobacco and, and public use. And um, overall, the, the numbers were astounding, and the kids actually guessed much lower of the percentages of tobacco use, the illnesses that come along with it, and all those things, especially with public use and the kids they I'm speaking here for the kids and the youth because they can't speak for themselves at these meetings because they're in school obviously so I the overall message that they want me to portray to you guys is that there needs to be stricter laws with uh, the tobacco use or drug use or whatever else, with beaches park and public areas All right thank you thank you 
Adriana Alvazan, followed by Matthew Margulis. Hello. Um, I work for the, um, also the Council of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse with the Friday Night Live program as the county coordinator. So Friday Night Live, if nobody knows, we're a youth-led, youth-driven statewide program. All these students are involved to be advocates in their community on issues that they're passionate about. And so um, just to add a little bit about what um, Brooks Jet mentioned, um, she's our intern, so she works directly with the youth and has a lot of conversations with them about like how they feel about these policies. And something that came up and that has actually come up time and time again is that when we have our meetings in public areas, there are sometimes not safe areas where we can walk through. So walking to State Street, sometimes to Paseo Nuevo to go into like maybe like Pizza Rev um, is a problem because we're constantly walking through people who can openly smoke and throw their cigarette butts. From one walk here back to Keda, I picked up um, 813 cigarette butts once after one of these meetings because I was so curious as to, you know, whether this was really a littering issue or just um, environmental injustice issue. And so our students are concerned mostly with what they cannot control, which is the areas where they frequent. So state beaches are a main concern for them because they want to make sure that they can get together with their friends, as well as the areas that prox the proximity area around schools. Although there is something in place at the schools where it does not allow for them to bring substances or any, really anything of harm to a campus, there is still little areas around where they can walk away from campus that are not safe space for them. So I just urge you to consider areas like that. Thank you. Dr. Magulis, uh, followed by Kathy, Catherine Richardson. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. Uh, I am a retired physician, an internist, a pulmonologist. My specialty was lung diseases. I did a fellowship at City of Hope in 1965. And I want to raise another issue about smoking or about exposure to smoke. Uh, we've been concerned about secondhand smoke uh, causing disease, and it does. That's not the only problem. People who have lung disease already, asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, silicosis, uh, you name it, in the past, incidentally, in the past 40 years, the incidence of asthma has gone up considerably, considerably since the advent of plastics. But getting back to the secondhand smoke and people who have already have lung disease, they have very sensitive airways, particularly in asthma, where they can be exposed to a very small amount and involuntarily their airways close, they become short of breath, they begin to wheeze, they become uncomfortable. And this is the most vulnerable group of people that we need to protect. The most vulnerable are those that are already in trouble, they've got lung disease, and when they get exposed they get into deep trouble. And so I would offer that into your consideration as to how to protect the most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Richardson, followed by Don Goldberg. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Katherine Richardson, and I personally think all outside public areas should be designated non-smoking. The health of the non-smoker should not be affected and subjected to the health risk by the ones who smoke and have no regards for their health, let alone the others around them. 
It is strange, but I have always thought that smoking should be banned, even in private backyards, as their smoking outside drifts to neighbors and suggests them to health risks. Um, we had next-door neighbors who were not allowed to smoke indoors by their landlord. That year, they lived there. We could not utilize our backyard at night as their chain smoking outside affected us. Our electric bill was extremely high that summer as we could not open up our windows. We tried fans to blow it back, and that didn't help. We had a fan going in our garage at night to blow out their smoke as our garage was attached to the house, causing us to you know, incur that smell. Our property was even 50 feet away from where they were sitting out. Um, and so can tax dollars received by tourism help offset some of the costs that the non-smokers incur by them? Smokers can smoke in their closed homes and not affect others, but a non-smoker cannot do much to avoid their toxic fumes in public. I take great pride in staying healthy and seriously object to being made to inhale toxic chemicals by a smoker. There's talk about businesses for losing their tourist income dollars. What, however, what about the increased health cost related to problems for the residents such as asthma and bronchitis? When we go to the beach to walk and breathe fresh air, I have a problem with the idea that we cannot um, breathe non-smoking air because tourists are here and the businesses need income. We do not patronize businesses that have designated smoking areas, so businesses do lose income by catering to smokers. Other non-smokers here have talked about how they have choices to join their smoking friends. We do not. Let us be known as a healthy spot for tourists to come and enjoy. Again, personally, I would like to see all public areas designated as non-smoking. Thank you. Thank you. Don Goldberg will be followed by Natasha Dorotvik. Dorick. <laughs> Good afternoon, council members. I'm Don Goldberg. I've been a member of CEASE for about the last 13 years, and I've worked uh, actively with a uh, number of organizations in town and have spoken extensively with business owners, physicians, and the general public. Uh, had a good uh, meeting with Santa Barbara pulmonary consultants, Dr. Jeff Kupperman and his whole team. And uh, they realized that by now everyone should be aware of the uh, serious health risks with regard to emphysema, lung cancer, heart issues and such with respect to secondhand smoke. Um, they have a phrase there, no smoke is good smoke. <laughs> they just feel that uh, the time has come to, uh, to ban the uh, secondhand smoke in the areas that we're referring to. Um, with, uh, with respect to the um, bar owners and the managers, uh, as Bob Stout recommend, uh, suggested or commented today that um, Don Dunn and I had a good conversation with him yesterday, uh, and he brought up some excellent points. Um, however, I think on many of the issues, we just have to respectfully uh, agree to disagree. Um, it, it comes down to the profits of the bar owners, the profits versus health. Uh, that may seem like an unfair uh, way to, to bluntly state it, but that's precisely what is happening. It's not that the bar owners' uh, profits are not respected. They, they are respected, but it's the public's health that should be a higher priority than the profits of, of the bars. Um, the bar owners' um, employees and their customers are affected same kinds of risk with respect to emphysema, lung cancer, and so forth. Uh, one of the main issues that I've discussed with a number of people is if, you've, if people have had the experience, the sad experience, of seeing people suffering and dying from emphysema, lung cancer, and such, it's not that it used to be talked about just elderly, but it's no longer the elderly uh, alone. It's a huge segment of the population. And that's what Santa Barbara Pulmonary, that's how they feel, that's how CEASE feels. And uh, I hope that you'll be in favor of, especially with the uh, patios and such. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Natasha Todorovic, followed by a soft demand. Is Natasha here? I think. She left. Okay. A soft demand, please. 
Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for hearing me out. Um, I'm a partner at uh, Nightlife Venues in downtown Santa Barbara. I'll probably be reiterating some of the same things that my peers have already said in the past. Um, I think we've met collectively, and uh, we're obviously a, a part of the community as well. Um, and would like, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that are that are on the table that we agree with in terms of, excuse me, public areas. Um, and just being, you know, Santa Barbara is a pretty progressive town, and we would like to make sure that um, that we provide a safe environment for all our citizens and our tourists. Um, it's just the part of the private property and the part of uh, the business that we're in that makes it a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit uncomfortable for us. Um, we understand that there's a need for regulation, um, but uh, there's, as was reiterated, as it was said in the past, uh, or by, by my peers, um, there's a big safety concern with people who smoke and have a couple of cocktails, and uh, when they want a cigarette, they're going to have a cigarette, and they're going to venture out. Um, we've actually talked to some of our peers in other communities who have, have who passed similar legislation, and uh, what usually happens is those customers end up going to a dark parking lot or down a dark alley, um, where we can't patrol them, uh, we can't clean up the cigarette butts after them, um, and uh, there's some major safety concerns that happens normally at this point. We'll be pushing our customers um, out to places that are not lit and unsupervised um, in order to, you know, to unfortunately, uh, you know, um, use the, uh, the substance that they're addicted to. Um, hopefully you guys... Uh, we'll take that under consideration when you make your ruling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, very good. Good good comments on all sides. It's uh, back to the committee. Anybody have a questions and or comments? Sure. Mr. Hodges. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Colon, the report from staff says that um, our smoking ordinance is no longer consistent with state laws how Can you bring me up oh uh, yeah i commented thank you i commented on that sometime back and uh i i'm not remembering the specific area i i i just don't john do you remember thank you chair uh council member Hoshkiss. uh in terms of uh state law uh, originally, one of the areas we had was the playgrounds and tots that we talked about around the playground right. areas and all that. Right. Uh, uh, outside of that, uh, from what I recall, uh, we were consistent with the bar and the percentage of 25%. So uh, outside of that, there's really not too much inconsistency. The uh, state law uh, pretty much has regulations, for example, in public buildings, public entryways. There's labor code in terms of protecting employees. Uh, so we're up to speed on all this. We're, we're up to speed. The, the rest of the state allows for uh, local regulation in terms of smoking. So outside the labor code, uh, the educational code, or the health and safety code, which I think we covered in terms of uh, uh, near windows or, or people work or employees work or um, uh, playgrounds or tots, uh, work okay. with the, left, so the rest of the – one rest area of, for sure. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Johnson, in our public outreach – with whom did we speak? I know we had that special website. Did we make – what other efforts did we make if we made any? Council Member Hotchkiss, we sent announcements uh, through our newsletters, our city news in brief. We sent a special uh, announcement for this public hearing to, I would say, approximately 5,000 businesses plus uh, – 1,000 to 2,000 community leaders, uh, the, the businesses, that's all the email addresses we have on file for anyone with a business license in the city. Uh, so that's probably our best uh, outreach in terms of contacting businesses. Uh, the uh, various community leaders, uh, people who have signed up for any of our publications, so that's almost 2,000 people who received a direct emailed notice of the public hearing and that contained all of the areas that we were considering as options uh, to have a possible smoke-free area. Also, just via email, I have contacted a number of different organizations, the Farmer's Market, uh, Old Spanish Days I see here, uh, a number of different groups, uh, the, some of the downtown businesses, downtown Santa Barbara, Earth Day, uh, groups that have special events, the Chamber, 
um, different groups who may, uh, Hospitality Santa Barbara, who spoke earlier, different groups who may want to have, to reach out to their membership, perhaps, and just mention that that was an option for them if they wanted to get ready for the hearing. Um, so as, as far and wide as we could cast that uh, announcement, we did. And several media outlets also put out uh, articles I saw in The Independent and in The Voice, there were features on this public hearing, including the email address for people to send in their comments. I'm not sure how we could do this, but the one group that this affects the most is people who smoke. Interestingly, the, of all the folks that spoke here, nobody came up and said, I'm a smoker. They, we're, talk, we're all talking businesses. Do we know how many smokers there are in Santa Barbara? Council Member Hotchkiss, I, I have... I, I, I've actually got an answer if you don't, so it's okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> I believe that I heard from uh, the County Public Health Department, Don Don. I thought it was about 9% in the county. Actually, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 17.8% of all adults are smokers, which is, to me... Tremendous surprise for Santa Barbara. I don't see that many people around smoking. So either they're the most discreet group, which I sort of think they are, um, or these numbers are off. But that's a lot of people. That's over 10,000 uh, 10, people that are smokers in Santa Barbara. Um, I, so I'm trying to balance here two sides. Um, and it's, they seem to be, at least on one side, totally exclusive. They don't want to hear about smoking at all. Um, we received a number of really, I hope you don't mind me making commentary at this point. We received a number of really extraordinary emails, one of which was a guy, an older gentleman, as I recall, who said that when he was driving on the freeway, if somebody was smoking in a car in front of him and the window was open, he had to change lanes. And I thought, well, there's no way to write an ordinance for that guy. I mean... <laughs> He's got a, that's a problem. He's either going to wear a mask all the time or whatever. So, um, other questions here. At one point, I think the staff thought that the harbor would be a good place to uh, ban smoking. Is that correct? Councilmember Hotchkiss, that's correct. Uh, in talking with waterfront staff, uh, they thought that both the wharf and the harbor area, uh, we should be designating both areas as smoke free. Okay, so how about people on uh, liveaboards and, and, and uh, on, uh, on a board a boat? What would the deal be there? That's a man is his home is his castle, but are we saying well, only sort of? Um, the issue actually, uh, the issue is that the with the harbor there's a lease, so I, that's kind of an issue we'd have to look into whether um, while. Um, they have their own boat as their own personal property, whether we could enforce based on the, the license to grant uh, someone to uh, to I'm sorry, that. say that again? The, the issue we'd have to look at, I don't have the answer off the top of my head, but the issue is whether uh, the license, the permission to dock there, uh, we can enforce uh, smoking to uh, be banned on their personal property of the boat. Uh, right now I don't have the answer, but that's something we could okay. could look at. Or, uh, or we could accept that, just say if you're a liver ward that we're not into that. Okay. Um, this one strikes a little bit close to home. I hope you'll forgive me here, but um, we're talking about sidewalks. Customers at small restaurants like the Paradise um, step outside to have a smoke because there's no place inside. Would this mean that they would be breaking the law then if they did that? If uh, they were to, if they, we if we banned it on public sidewalks and they were smoking on the sidewalk, they could be uh, issued a citation for that. Okay. Yes. Um, at one point, we were talking about smokers' outposts. I think Carpentry doesn't have any, but they established that option. How would we establish that option here? Uh, Council Member Hotchkiss, that we could look at any. Council could look at any number of ways on the ordinance committee. Uh, in Carpinteria, my understanding is uh, they allow for the businesses to designate a certain area, come up with an area that's appropriate as a smoker's outpost. So I'm sure there are a number of different configurations we could make if we uh, allowed that. 
Is that a legal issue, Mr. Cohen, at all? Smokers outpost? No, no, it's not. It's not a legal issue. It goes back to the uh, 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 issue of the uh, cities being able to uh, regulate locally. So outside of the uh, uh, areas by state law, which have covered occupied the field, like we talked about, the top playgrounds and all that, that's up to, left to the cities. Other than that, it's wide open. What we can do? Correct. Okay, great. Um, Galena and Buellton exempt bars from smoking ordinances, correct? That's correct. Okay, so they're totally ex exempt, so you can go in and have a beer at five and a cigarette also? Correct. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to hold up so much time. Just one more, two, two more things here. Sorry? Okay. Um, the existing public policy, according to what I can find in the city of Santa Barbara, says that um, we should achieve a balance between encouraging a smoke-free environment for the public and <clears throat> not posing a significant burden to the smoking public and businesses impacted by the ordinance. Do those, does that uh, policy remain in effect? Just to clarify, is that part of the ordinance language or uh, council report? I'm not sure where I got this from, but it's someplace. Maybe it was in the, exist, the first council report, you know, the last time we had this. Yes. Um, I think in the previous update of our smoking laws, uh, both the tobacco retail ordinance and uh, the smoking ordinance, we were looking at a balance and uh, coming up with areas where people could smoke. Okay, so that policy, as far as we know, still is in effect. Okay. So, you, all right. I think that's all I got right now. Thank you for putting up with my questions. Real. Thank you. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is that our Santa Barbara Youth Council, our teen advisory group to the city council, recommended expanding our smoking restrictions. And so they want us to get uh, include vaping and um, marijuana and they said it was gross to walk on State Street and get a, a breath of smoke. So just to let you know, our teen council did um, weigh in on that. Um, and I myself have done cleanups and cleaned up a lot of cigarette butts. It's kind of amazing. We were at Bonnet Park, and there was just tons of them. And once you look in the grass, it, so I, I'm persuaded by the fact that it causes environmental pollution. But I'm going to call on Ms. Henderson, who's sitting out there, because one of the things that we're going to consider is restricting it in public events. And you're representing uh, Old Spanish Days today. You didn't say anything, Ms. Henderson, but do you have anything to say? Do I, I think people sometimes smoke during Fiesta events, and um, that's a pretty big item on this list. Um, yes, I want to thank Nina for bringing it to our attention. We're gathering information. I mean, Fiesta is a community event, so yes, why we're the spearheads, it is a community event. Um, the only issue we've had with non-smoking so far is at um, Del Norte, we have a beer garden, and that currently is a non-smoking area. We've had no issues. Um, I'm actually really here today to hear from the community what they want. And also, how would it affect us? Because most of our festival area, the Parade, Del Norte, Delaguerra, Pequena, Primavera, all these areas are in either city or county areas. Hmm. So I'm assuming you will be dictating to us. So mostly information gathering. Understood. Thank you so much, then. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Johnson, can we go back to the lists that you had? Ms. Brown, one minute, please. Mr. Colon? Yeah, just a quick follow-up. State law does not allow smoking in the indoor areas of bars, so Goleta and Buellton or wherever it is do not have laws that allow smoking in bars. That's what I, Yeah, not inside, right? Okay. Thank you. So can I have the list, Ms. Johnson, of the ones that staff recommends, yes, we... Okay, so this is the one. Stearns Wharf, the harbor, beaches, parks, community centers. So I agree that we should not have smoking in these areas. Okay, just for the record. Okay, next list is the one where this is more open to, this is the part that's open to discussion for me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm persuaded by the uh, hospitality Santa Barbara that we let 
um, especially bars decide about their smoking policies, also outdoor work sites. Um, restaurants, I, I, I'm not being lobbied by any restaurants about, um, maybe we'll hear from a member of our ordinance committee who owns a restaurant. Um, <laughs> I'm not being lobbied by people who own restaurants, so I'm, I, you know, I guess I'm neutral on that, um, but it does seem to make sense that after 10 p.m., uh, I, I don't think there's, uh, uh, that, that to me is, it makes sense in terms of civil liberties is they can smoke after 10 o'clock, uh, entries to public buildings. Um, I, I think I, yes, ban smoking on that sidewalks and commercial areas. This one for me, state street is a public plaza and, uh, yeah, I think we should ban smoking on, on State Street. Um, I guess we could talk about the blocks specifically, but I think that's already designated in our downtown organization. You might know better the blocks. So is it Victoria to the Dolphin Fountain? Um, uh, the Paseos are private property, so uh, I would let them decide about that. And then public events and parades... That would also be something that the organization to ma should make a decision about, creating the outpost areas um, for, for those. So I've weighed in on that list. And, um, and again, I'm hoping that LCs and other bars that are, and nightclubs that are near residences or other neighbors that have concerns that they'll work out um, fans or... or uh, those smoke cleaning machines, I, I'm not sure what they're called, uh, but I've seen them, and other, other ways to work with their neighbors. And then also to be very, very careful about, about the butts and what, and what we do with those. So uh, those are my comments. Chair Rouse, uh, Council, Council Member Muriel, just to clarify, on the Paseos, so there are private paseos, and then there are also public paseo areas. I think if you visualize the area around Lot 10, um, that area, the areas are, the paseos around that area are public. So, so public paseos, yes, no smoking. And then the private paseos is private property, and they should make up their own, their own rules. Thank you. Which segues nicely into my next question, or, or something I'd like to get resolved. I've asked about it previous in this hearing. So, for example, in the Paseos around Law 10, we lease out a portion of that Paseo to Dargans, and that is their de facto outdoor place where some people go out and smoke. So the definition of what a, a public, if, for example, we don't go to regulate privately controlled areas, leased areas, or whatever, what, what do we do in that case? So I think that's important to uh, determine. And uh, the other one was, I said, this is a little more obscure, but since we're going to carve out El Carrillo uh, within a housing project, when other housing projects have ho smoking restrictions, my concern is that other areas, and I'm thinking, you know, around al or places like that, where people in recovery do tend to smoke. And are we going to make, is there, and I, what I'd like to find out is from the recovery uh, part of our society, how critical that is. I mean, certainly we don't want to, you know, exacerbate a problem that's that's already there, uh, and it's our way to deal with that. I think we, we need a little bit more information on that. Um, and, you know, as, as far as our input to the staff, from my personal standpoint, I'd really like to see us keep this as simple and broad as possible, great public spaces like parks, beaches, streets, and whatnot, and, and try to, uh, if we can help it, stay out of the... the the private business. Uh, I know that we're in the workplace, seeing as I have a workplace, I understand all about Prop 65 laws and protecting your own employees. And so I think anybody that that promotes or allows smoking on a premise is taking that risk already. Uh, but I was around, as Mr. Stout said, back in the day in the first rodeo or two back in the 90s, uh, when the smoking laws were trying to create these hyper-complicated uh, physical and mechanical barriers 
other kinds of separations, and it became so unwieldy that it, we just gave it all together. As it turns out, especially in the hospitality industry, we were providing for what our customers wants before the law even caught up to us. In other words, we went non-smoking because that's what people wanted. Now, there may be these rarefied situations in these smaller clubs and whatnot where that's still a part of their their clientele, and and, you know, we should try to do as little harm as possible when it comes to that kind of thing, in my opinion. So I, I don't want to make this too nuanced. I don't want to make it too complicated. I understand the proximity of residential areas next to an outdoor smoking patio is a problem. And so those kind of things, I think we need some either some other community uh, comparisons or input to see if there's a way around those. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I think I had one other thing. Um, well, yeah, just, just going back to that, you know, if, if I have a public sidewalk, but I do charge rent on a portion of it on a monthly basis to an operation, do the rules of the road pertain to the public sidewalk or do they pertain to the private operation? And I think I'd like, a, I'd like some clarification on that if I could next time around. And so, um, I'll go ahead, Mr. Doimus. Thank you, Chairman Rouse. Uh, Committee. Also, uh, uh, we will provide the answers to those questions. Also, I think one thing that uh, uh, wasn't focused on here today, I think that should be within the scope of the committee, uh, is not just only the designation of places where we restrict smoking, but also the types of smoking. I think that is one nuance that is uh, where our ordinance currently is outdated. When I say that, I'm talking about like vaping, marijuana smoking as well. So. Uh, uh, what we'd like is direction as well as in terms of including uh, an updating ordinance to include all these various types of smoking. So it's not just uh, defined singularly to cigar smoking or cigarette smoking, but also e -vape, uh, vaping and, uh, and uh, marijuana smoking as well. And as I understand it, the vaping uh, is included in the county smoking ordinance, is it not? I, I, believe, I believe so. Yes. And I think uh, the uh, Prop 64 also included... Uh, any restrictions on tobacco, which included vaping, would pertain also to marijuana consumption. That is correct. Okay, so we've got a little work cut out for us. Ms. Mario. I'm ready to make a motion and see if we can make some agreements today, and then we're going to come back, right, with some of those answers, specifically when businesses lease sidewalk, city sidewalk. That was, we needed to research that if I'm Correct. Uh, it, actually, I think that's a policy prerogative. It, 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 it uh, could be described as a public space. It could be described as an outdoor patio. So I, I really think you can make that decision today if, if you'd like to. Um, obviously, it's closer to, to the sidewalk than maybe some other patios. But I, I think you have the discretion to call it out however you'd like provided it's not within 20 feet of the entrance to a public building. Well, I mean, that's a great point, but I want to say I'm, I'm just I'm thinking, of this, thinking about this one example. I'm thinking about if, for example, we allow uh, the private patios of a business, and I'm going to just call out Whiskey Richards as one is that's right next to a public sidewalk. And then I go back to Dargan's, which is something we lease to Dargan to do, but it is part of his operation. He's at our can be. He has to insure it. He has to license it on his ABC license, all the above. And so that's that's the kind of, and you said that may be a just a policy as opposed to an actual Yeah, code uh, let direction. me say it this way. I think you could uh, prohibit it on publicly owned lease space, but I don't think you have to. Okay. And then today, as I understand, if I just interrupt you for a moment, Ms. Murillo, is we're going to give... Rather than deciding something, we're actually just giving direction for staff to come back with some flesh outs on these, or does, I mean, is that how I read the uh, recommendations? Well, uh, that's your prerogative. My preference would be to get a draft going of an ordinance. So. Okay. Very good. I'm sorry, Ms. Rio. Well, what I'm thinking is, so say two of us agree on something, and then that becomes the recommendation to council. It, it's it's not going to matter until all seven of us are up here arm wrestling, right? So um, uh, I, if, we can, if the three of us can come to an agreement now, that's going to be a stronger recommendation. So 
I'd like to move that we include vaping and marijuana as part of the smoking regulations. Mr. Doimus, does that cover that one concern that you had about what they're smoking? I, th I think in terms of our new ordinance, and including the definition of smoking, that would cover what it would include. So that would deal when Mr. Colon is correct, that I think it would make sense to bring a ordinance in front of you and we would include those in the definitions and, uh, and that would encompass everything in that. Yes. Uh, okay. The Adult Use of Marijuana Act that just passed uh, uh, a couple weeks ago uh, allows on-premise non-medical marijuana use only in licensed establishments and micro businesses, meaning business marijuana businesses licensed, and it explicitly does not allow uh, the use of marijuana where alcohol is sold. So the, the way I read the um, AUMA, um, the council will need to decide where it wants to allow uh, marijuana use. And the big ambiguity in the AUMA is what is a public place. It doesn't define that term. It may seem obvious, but it's not when you really start looking at it. So I think that there will need to be a follow-up mm -hmm. to determine where you want to allow uh, marijuana smoking. The way the state law is framed, it, it anticipates it only happening at marijuana businesses. And our city council has not f formulated those regulations yet. No, you've directed your staff to, to get to work on it. And we have up to a year to do it, if I'm remembering? Well, the licensing provisions of the AOMA don't go into effect until 2018, which is coincident with the timing for the medical marijuana regulations that the state is supposed to be putting out. The Interim ordinance you enacted runs until, if I remember right, around the end of August 2018. Certainly, we're going to try and do do it a lot faster than that. And there's obviously a lot of public interest and public support for non-medical uh, marijuana use. But your regulation on the books now forbids non-medical businesses until August of 2018. But we can decide today, if the three of us agree that we want to ban smoking on the city beaches, we can include marijuana, vaping, and tobacco as we can define that today. You, you can, but I don't think you need to. Uh, the, the, again, the AOMA establishes uh, fines for marijuana use in public places. The question is, what's a public place? A beach, I'm not so worried about. That's obviously a public place. But whether public place includes a public accommodation, like a hotel or a bar or a restaurant, those are public accommodations, I don't know. So I think the city will have to define that. Well, so you, you also said, I mean, they also, excuse me, it also says wherever tobacco is explicitly prohibited with the code. Correct. You know, I'm, I'm so. How should I frame my motion then? Well, uh, it really depends uh, what you're trying to achieve. If you want us to work separately on where marijuana use is allowed, I think that's um, uh, a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about today. If you want to talk about where marijuana use would be prohibited, we can either report back or ma and make some recommendations, or we can report back and tell you what the state law says in greater detail. So Maybe prohibitive or permissive, that's, that's the difference that I'm trying to. So you're saying you want to come back with that information before we vote on the items before us? N no. I think that the, the presentation and the direction from the council last May was about smoking tobacco. And I think that the change in state law will not be impactful until at least 2018. And I think it's clear that places like sidewalks and beaches and parks are, are not intended 
for marijuana smoking under the AUMA. So I don't think you need to do anything about that. What are, where I think the council is going to need to act is to define where non-medical marijuana use may take place. And I'm saying that that is kind of outside the scope of what the council directed us to look at here. So our assumption as staff has been that part of the direction under the interim ordinance that prohibits non-medical marijuana businesses is to look at the smoking issue as part of that package. Well, if I could suggest maybe even using staffs, we could go down their list if you'd like and give it a yay, nay, or look at this further. Is that uh, make... I, I would like to include vaping to be up with the county ordinances uh, today. Yeah, vaping tobacco. Right. right. E-cigs. Yeah, we even, let me be uh, clear about that. We've, our ordinance refers to combustion. I believe that our existing ordinance applies to e-cigarettes because it is a combustion process. Many, 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 many cities have added vaping or e-cigs to their smoking ordinance. Uh, I think it's a good idea. I don't think it's essential. But when we redraft the smoking regulations, we're certainly going to identify vaping and e-cigs as, as uh, 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 smoking. I'd like this body today to say vaping is included as tobacco. I, I move that we include vaping in our ordinance. Motion or? No, just for now. I think we need to take this in pieces. So, yes, yeah, so I'm just making one simple motion to include vaping as part of a, the definition of tobacco smoking. Is that it? That's the only motion we're making here? <laughs> I was just making, I was doing it piecemeal. Then sure. I, then All right, I we'll wanted, go along with that. Okay. 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 Well, yes, let's do it. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Right. Now let's uh, go on with the real deal. Yeah, now, what, once again, we don't necessarily have to make definitive things here. We're looking f to give staff direction to come back to us. And I, I've given a couple of my points that I'd like to see. Okay. Um, there, there may be points, as Ms. Murillo said, that we can agree on to go forward on. There's a laundry list by staff. But we are going to have another bite of the apple here in ordinance. So, Yeah, it's coming Mr. back. Mr. Hodges. Oh, um, no, I'm not in complete agreement on this. And I, and I want to explain why. I don't want to disenfranchise 11,000 plus Santa Barbarans just because they're the minority. We're supposed to protect the minority. That's part of the way the American system works. And I don't think we've examined carefully enough the question of parks and beaches. The reason I say parks is mostly smoking in parks now, as I see it, is um, from transients. And I don't care what we pass, they're not going to care. So does it make sense to do that or not? I don't know. We need to talk about that more. Insofar as beaches are concerned, um, they're not a fire hazard, that's for sure. Um, I find doubtful some of the millions of cigarette butts that people say they find down there because I go down to the beach and I don't shuffle through butts. So what that really means is somebody likes to go to the beach and have a cigarette, which is, that's fine. If the wind is blowing, people want to have a cigarette, fine. On the other hand, we have campsites down at the beach that are also vagrants where a lot of smoking goes on. Maybe we do want to exclude that. These are all fine questions that we haven't examined well. So I think I'm going to probably be a, um, an opponent to the motion, not because I disagree with all of it, but because I disagree with some of it, um, as I suspect the motion will come up. But I do want to say I think we ought to respect the people who uh, do have a cigarette and are super conscious about how they smoke and where they smoke. I just don't want to say you people are bad people, because they're not. Okay, well, in the interest of time, we should move forward with some staff recommendations. And I, I, I will say in response that I, in fact, do find a lot of cigarette butts at the beaches when I, when I do the beach community cleanup things. And I do think that while we may look at the, I, I don't want to truncate individual rights, there are the rights of those who don't smoke and who are affected by people around them who do smoke. So I think it's a double-edged sword. Um, 
here's what I would like to see. I would like to take at least the first half of the stack re staff recommendations, which seem like we could get consensus on those, unless, uh, unless you'd like to dissent on those, Mr. Hodgkins, which you may well, um, which would be those uh, uh, which already have some of the restrictions in place. Like, well, like the tra parts, most of Stearns Wharf, why is any smoking allowed on Stearns Wharf would be beyond me. Okay. Um, you know, uh, parks are this, have been at the discretion of the parks director. They have not necessarily taken that move. They have done it at the library, but those that's already done. Um, certainly, uh, most community centers, uh, public par uh, parking parking structures are they're there. Yes, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I don't see anything on this list that necessarily falls into uh, making people's rights to smoke diminished other than you couldn't maybe smoke at the beach or at the park but i would like to think that we're down there playing with our kids and doing things outdoors at the beach and parking at the harbor with the board on board living well on board living is our thing too because you have very close proximity to other people who are not uh smoking down there and you're also on a lot of flammable materials to be honest with you so i don't ever like see people smoking on boats ever to be um but being a harbor user myself, I actually don't see that much activity. Uh, and as, there's, as Mr. Doyman said, there is a question as to you, you have a month-to-month -month lease when you were sitting on a boat in a, in a slip, no matter how much you paid for it. You don't own that slip. So I don't know what the real rights would be and how that would preclude that. To, to that point, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. a liveaboard can smoke inside of their boat because it's their private home, their private residence. And I don't know how you'd enforce it otherwise. Do we have an otherwise. answer to that? I don't see anyone from the Harbor Department here. You would have the authority to prohibit it. I think what uh, Mr. Doyman's concern, which is uh, significant, is is there some sort of federal or state preemption because they're sitting in the water? I, I, I think that needs to be looked at, but the uh, city's position has consistently been that uh, people who are uh, docked in the Harbor don't have a real property interest. They have a license to use that space. A license is similar to a ticket to a ball game. Uh, you can't smoke at Dodger Stadium. You can't smoke at the marina. So I, I think that's where it ends up, but we do need to look at uh, preemption issues. Then if we exempted the harbor from the discussion today, M Mr. Rouse, do you think you and I agree on all the other points? I do. And we can... The, at least the two of us put forward this recommendation to the city council. But I know we're coming back to the ordinance committee. Um, and then we'll get an answer about the marina and visit, visiting boats and people who live on their boats. I'm, I'm not being lobbied by people who live on their boats about their smoking rights or yeah. uh, maybe they don't know. Uh, and that's to your point. Mr. Hotchkiss, there might be people here who don't know that we're having this discussion. So I will move that the Ordinance Committee recommend to the City Council restricting smoking on all of these items except for the harbor, which we'll bring back for a discussion at Ordinance. So to be clear, Stearns Wharf, public beaches, parks, sports fields, trails, community centers, outdoor recreation facilities, outdoor library areas, and public parking structures and lots. My question is, how would it affect bars and uh, night spots downtown? It wouldn't, right? This is outside of that. That's the other list. Yeah. All right. Well, I, again, I'm going to just, I'll oppose it, but with the provisos of why I mentioned before, so that I can bring those back up. So that be a, so, so I'll second the motion. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay. So we got that part down. And the rest of it, I think, has some questions for staff in terms of, uh, some of the nuances of the indoor, outdoor, private, public. Um, man, I do not want to have to get into mechanical and physical separation and ventilation because that was just a, a wormhole we went down all those years ago. Isn't that right, Mr. Stout? <laughs> exactly. So um, with that, uh, unless anybody has any more comments, I think, to, uh, Nina, do you feel like staff has enough to go on here to bring back? to ordinance at a future date. 
some more detail. Yes, uh, Chair Ross, and I think there might have been, uh, I think th there were some questions about other uh, recovery centers, I believe, and Ms. Dunn from the Public Health Department had some information if you wanted to hear that now. Okay. You know, the Salvation Army and the Rescue Mission, those are private places, and I do understand why the Housing Authority allows smoke, smoking at El Carrillo. When people get sober, they stop drinking and using drugs. Yes, you could argue tobacco is a drug, but they're allowed that one thing as they transition from a drug-dependent lifestyle. So our Housing Authority knows what they're doing with resident services, and I, I trust that they know what they're doing, allowing some smoking at El Carrillo, and I'm sure they control where it is with outposts and et cetera. But it, I, and, I, and I guess, Mr. Chair, I'm trying to figure out, you're asking about these other recovery places, how they deal with smoking? Not specifically. Tobacco? I just want to know, and, and maybe Ms. Hodgkins has some clarification, how we, in other words, how we carve that out you know, per se as other, you know, and, and maybe we don't go there because, it, you know, but there are other places that handle people in recovery. And I don't know, for example, all the neighborhoods that have sobering centers in them as residences, you know, residential recovery centers. I mean, where are we going to go with all, you know, all that if all of a sudden those people aren't supposed to smoke in that house, but they're not supposed to go now on their neighborhood sidewalk? Are we going to run into some issues? And are we causing a problem? I mean, I don't know those answers, and that's why I'd like to have more information. Mr. Hodgkins. Just a quick addition to that. Uh, my experience with private 12-step programs is that they do allow smoking. People are very careful about how they do it, but they consider it, first off, a private endeavor, and they do consider that part an important part of their program, as apparently they do at El Carrillo. So I, I, I would cons leave that off the table. Yeah, I, I'm not sure we need to get too far into it now. Just, just kind of a food for thought thing. I think it's something's resolvable. So, and, and uh, Chair Ross, what I will point out is that uh, we can get we can follow up and get some more information on how other facilities are handled. Uh, but for now, I mean, just in looking at our approach overall, we don't have to include these sites overall in our smoking ordinance. Uh, the Housing Authority has their own policy right now. Uh, prohibiting smoking on most sites except for the one. So their policy can remain in effect, and we don't have to include these sites in the ordinance. Well, it's true. In most ordinances, more, the more simple, the better. So we'll see what we come up with. Uh, anything else from committee members? We've got 15 minutes away to our other big meeting, so we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much.